This podcast is brought to you by KimPower, the reliable, quick, and scalable EV charging solutions for everyone and everywhere. And StarCharge, the largest EV charging manufacturer in the world and is also a provider of residential and commercial battery storage. Hello, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast. You join me, your host, Francie, Kyle from Out of Spec, of course, and our special guest, a self-described longtime listener, first-time caller, Brian, who is also an EV enthusiast. So welcome, guys. I appreciate you taking the time today, and I hope you have been enjoying the winter holidays so far. Yeah, so far, so good. Uh, thrilled to be with you guys. Uh, like I said, been following what you've been doing for a while, and uh happy to participate here. Yeah, we're really happy to have you. So uh, I was happy that you reached out as well, because you're not only an EV enthusiast with um, a nearly Kyle Connor sized approach with five EVs at home, but you are also the owner of a Fisker Ocean One, which is a topic that we have been hoping to cover a bit more on the Out of Spec channels lately, especially from the owner point of view. So before we dive into Brian's experience with his Fisker Ocean One, I wanted to describe a little bit of Fisker, which we do in our other Fisker episode as well, but just to give a little bit of a background because it's not a super, super well-known EV automaker. So the company was founded in 2016 by Henrik Fisker. It's an American electric vehicle company and Fisker Henrik has a an interesting background that we won't go too deep into, but it does make the exploration of this automaker a little bit interesting because he does have a lot of experience here, you know, challenges, failures, and then coming back at it again. So he gained a lot of recognition for his work at BMW. He later joined uh, Aston Martin as well as its design director, and then eventually co-founded Fisker Automotive in 2007. And they aim to make, you know, really high performance luxury plug-in hybrid EVs, but all of that ended in bankruptcy, unfortunately, in 2013. But it didn't stop him, as we all know, and he went out, went on to fund, not fund, but found, maybe fund too, Fisker Inc., like I said, back in 2016. So that is leading us to where we find ourselves today. And the Fisker Ocean One was originally unveiled back in 2020 at a CES show, at the CES show, and now we're finding them on the roads, finally, or in Brian's garage. So Brian, as you told me, us, you own a handful of EVs. So what made you decide to add the Fisker Ocean to your lineup? Yeah, so it, it was just a, a family demand, really. Um, before I get into that, let me just give you guys a super quick walkthrough of my journey um, to be an EV owner, because uh, I think that context will definitely help. So I think the caption for this story is that we're, we're great at acquiring them, but unlike Dave and Kyle, we're, we're terrible at getting rid of them, right? <laughs> and I think part of the issue is the names that we come up with for our cars, uh, for us, it started with uh, the Model S, right? And uh, this goes back to 2013. We took delivery of our Model S, first Model S. Kyle, you'll appreciate this. It was brown, right? Brown was only built for yes. maybe six to eight months. The original right? brown, so rare, so cool. And it was a 60, right? So it was a brown 60 sitting on 22s Hell yes. right, w with with all the other options um i called it chocolate rain right so that was <laughs> the name of that car and uh my brother was the one who convinced me to uh go ahead and get the brown and it was such a good decision it was unique very very quickly and um that's where our journey started uh we bought that car it was more money it was in the 90s in terms of price more money than I'd ever spent on a car, obviously, uh, at that time. Absolutely loved it. Drove it for about 18 months. And then they came out with the dual motor, right? And um, I decided at that time, you know what? I'm going to sell this car to my brother. And because these things are essentially computers on wheels or smartphones on wheels, I'm going to try leasing, right? Because I'm going to want a new one every few years. And so we leased in 2015 an 85D. Um, I did not go for the 21s because during my ownership with Chocolate Rain, we bent and cracked a wheel. Um, and I wasn't aware of this until I started losing air consistently every day. 
And um, it was 2,500 bucks to replace one of those 21s. Plus, I didn't know at the time that 21 is kind of an odd size for wheels, at least at that time it was. And so tires were super expensive. I could have bought 22s for less than what I was playing for the 21s. Anyway, long story short, we leased. Um, at that time, it wasn't called Midnight Silver. It was some sort of a gray, right? So I called that one Smokey the Beast and um, had a great experience with that. Um, at the end of the, the lease period, however, um, actually before that, that was in 2015. The following year, we got a call from Tesla that our Model X, which we had ordered, um, was ready. So we went, we picked that up. That was now my wife's daily driver. So 2016 six-seater 90D on 20-inch slipstreams, right? We did not go for the larger 22-inch wheels on that, was that like one. The full road trip spec back then. That was the longest range with the most aero wheels. 5,000 pound towing capacity, um, which we did use that to tow our camper, which I'll come back to in a second. So at that point, we had Smokey the Beast and we named, oh, the Model X was titanium, which was also a color right. they only built for a short <laughs> amount of time, right? So it was super unique. Uh, we still have that car today. We actually just moved it up to Cape Cod and it lives there. Um, but Absolutely love that. That was my wife's daily driver, like I said. Um, so at the end of Smokey's um, lease period, this was now in 2018, um, I had a decision to make and I wanted to buy it. But the economics of the lease buyout versus buying a new Model 3 uh, just didn't make sense, right, to, to buy it out. So long story short, we ended up buying a 2018 Model 3 Red Long Range. And uh, we named that one Firefly. But to bring this back to your question, Francie, uh, we've had that Model 3 since brand new in, in uh, 2018. And we ended up uh, this past August handing it off to our youngest child, um, once she got her license, um, she's in early college. So somebody needs to drive her to and from school every day. And so it was great that she passed her driving test literally the Friday before school started on Monday. And so that's her car. And so we've been planning, you know, what are we going to get my wife to replace that? And I saw the ocean a couple of years ago and, um, you know, the story of the car, uh, using so much recycled materials from the ocean, right? Um, and some of the unique features that it had, um, that was going to be the car for my wife once we gave um, Firefly to our daughter. However, <laughs> I had also put in an order for uh, a Rivian R1S. <laughs> and... Um, we got the call from Rivian earlier this year. And um, last year, I took the step to lock in both our Rivian as well as our um, Fisker orders, right? So that uh, we would qualify under the transition rule to get the tax break, right? That's $7,500 per vehicle. Um, so I went ahead and did that last year. Um, so that we'd be in a position to do that should we take delivery. And in May of this year, the Saturday before Mother's Day, we flew out to normal and uh, they picked us up at the airport in an R1S and uh, drove us to the factory, gave us a tour. Um, what I didn't include there is the fact that we went ahead and switched our reservation from an R1S to an R1T because we realized that Kaya was our youngest. She's on her way out. She's driving herself. She's going to college next year. We don't need three rows. And when we looked at all of the utility and storage within the R1T, it just seemed to be a much better fit. And the only thing I regret is not making that decision early enough to get one of the launch editions, right? We ended up not getting the launch edition with the uh, auto tonneau cover, but... Um, we got the silver spec, 
with uh, 21 inch road wheels. I literally took the aero covers off Kyle right at the factory. Um, so they wouldn't mess up the paint on the wheels. Uh, it's ocean coast interior. And um, so that's what we've been driving until the Fisker um, was put on a boat from Vienna to, to come over here. Uh, well, I guess it's Graz, Austria is where, where they're building it. And um, it's been a roller coaster ever since. So that, that's a little bit of the story. It feels like that took forever. No, but that's <laughs> amazing. Story. Talk about some of the coolest cars. You've had some of the rarest Tesla colors. Then you got to pick up your Rivian at the factory. I picked up my Rivian at the factory as well. And yep. that is just such a cool experience because you go beyond like end of line where they have all those chargers hanging down from the roof and where they have all the vehicles parked. And then the Rivian's right there in that little back building. It's just so neat. Um, and the factory is pretty incredible as well. Um, yeah, that is, that's a great story. That could be a whole yeah. podcast just on your car ownership, but okay. So, uh, the car was built in Graz by Magna, your Fisker. It was shipped over here. What even was the sales process like? Because that's something we haven't heard very much of yet, which is, I know they are doing direct to consumer sales. Is there any dealer involved? How does that actually work? Yeah, there's no there's no dealer involved. It's very similar to the uh, Tesla and Rivian processes in terms of everything is handled online. Um, there was a human introduced to the process called a uh, vehicle admin, right? Once your vehicle is built and sort of put on put in transit, right on the boat, um, you get a vehicle admin who is there to help you navigate the buying process, right? So everything from, you know, starting to pull together a proof of insurance. If you're going to do financing, Fisker does work with, I think, Wells Fargo is their financing partner, right? To, um, to do financing. We did not use their financing. Um, so we didn't go down the path with them on that. But the vehicle admin essentially takes you from that order, official ordering process all the way to um, delivery, right? And then after delivery, we actually have a, I guess you can call it a customer representative. So I actually have a person that I can reach out to and call uh, or email if I've got any sort of post sales, in which case it would be service related um, questions or, or concerns. In addition to Fisker having set up a, a a one eight four four Fisker one is the number, right? And that is for only those owners who've actually taken delivery, right? So if you haven't taken delivery yet, uh, they typically will route your call out of that queue for Fisker one into more of a general customer service number. So that's been the experience. But I got to say, the most painful part of this process is between the time because it takes a, a couple of weeks to get across the ocean in our case the port of baltimore is where the vehicles came in right and they've got to clear customs which seemed to take an inordinate amount of time it felt like it took almost three weeks to clear customs and then they're working with an outfit called adessa um which is out near dulles airport and if you're familiar with this area from the port of baltimore to dulles depending on traffic is anywhere from, you know, an hour and 15 to an hour and 45 minutes, right? Um, where the, they, they have their, what they call VPC, Vehicle Processing Center, right? Where the vehicles come in and they're prepped for delivery to customers. They're also working with an outfit called uh, Run Buggy, which has covered, if they're going beyond a certain distance, right? They have these covered, trucks that uh, the cars will be put into, or they've got non-covered ones for shorter distances. And in our case, they had gotten backed up in terms of delivery there in late October. And so they ended up uh, having employees go out to certain locations to help with deliveries. And we ended up with a guy named Kevin, who is one of the UI designers that delivered our car. He literally got in the car and drove it from the VPC in Sterling, Virginia, over to our house here in Maryland. 
And um, it was really cool because you got a UI designer doing the delivery and we recorded an hour long video that I shared with another friend on YouTube where Kevin is walking us through the UI which he played an integral role in designing. That is so, so that was cool. our delivery experience. That's amazing. That's so pretty nice. But okay, so did they the so I've seen Rivian and others who offer home delivery, Lucid, et cetera, where they put them on the back of a truck, like one of those Carvana rollback things yep. and bring it. Is that how they delivered your ocean or did they drive the vehicle the itself over to your house? Well, once I made the final payment, right, um, at that point, I feel like you got to deliver what I paid for, right? And they were backed up. So our original delivery, which was like within a week of our final payment, was canceled, right? They said, we're backed up. We can't do it. So I escalated. I said, guys, you got to make this right. And so that, at that point, they said, look, we've got some employees in town. We're going to work with them to get you the car sooner. Cool. So, so they made it. It wasn't a usual situation then. Correct. It was all hands on deck. Let's get get this backlog cleared and get these cars into customers' hands. So that's how it ended up with Kevin driving out here. Uh, obviously, it put more miles on the car. When we received it, it had 55 miles on it. Yeah, which is right. not that's normal. That's d- delivery yeah. mileage. That's fine, and and um, that's cool. You know, you just hope they don't crash it driving it there. <laughs> so, exactly. Right. Um, with with it was dark when he got here. It was dark, so the typical inspection that you want to do on paint quality and all those things we couldn't really do because we're in the driveway. It's mm-hmm. dark, mm-hmm. Um, so we didn't get benefit of that. But. Um, that there, there were some things that we were able to see either that night or the next morning that we put on uh, a ticket for them to resolve. For example, the driver's side B pillar uh, had what looked like smudges on it, right? It's like a piano black on, on that particular plastic panel. And we thought it was something because Kevin was there. He literally came with a bag of... Um, microfiber cloths that he picked up at Walmart wow. and some sort of uh, cleaning stuff for vehicles. <laughs> and here's this guy, a wet UI designer, right? Trying to make the car presentable for a customer, right? Bless his heart, right? Yeah. But um, so there was, there was that damage. The next morning I found that there was some plastic residue on the very front of uh, the hood from where you know they wrap the cars in that white plastic when they travel and that's what it looked like there was some residue there that needed to be cleaned off um the vents uh front vents do not work right so we called them they said well we've had some issues with this take a pencil and sort of pry it open right because the vents in this car is are controlled in the touch screen so i did that and even though the vents were now open Nothing was blowing out of it. So we had the issue with the B-pillar, uh, smudges on the paint from the glue residue, and we had the, um, the vents not working. Right? And that but, was all taken care of through their service department, I imagine. So literally yesterday, we had our first um, service call. So they wow. sent a mobile technician out here, a guy who spent a decade at, at uh, Hyundai, as an EV certified engineer is now there as of last month. So they have three techs in this area. One of them was hired in October, um, the other two last month in November. And uh, he came out yesterday, wasn't able to fix anything, (laughs) but we got a professional diagnosis of, Mm -hmm. yes, I need to replace that panel on the B pillar. Um, we need to send, they're, they're actually opening up a service center in Owings Mills, Maryland, which I don't know, it's about 30, 40 minutes from here. Um, and they're already starting to do some work there, according to him. Um, and then I also found while he was here, there was a, a little cable with a connector on the end of it hanging down in the driver's footwell. Mm. And he initially speculated, this is literally was 24 hours from right now he was here. And he was speculating that maybe that's a disconnect that's causing the issue 
with the front fence not working. After escalating to some engineers, what we found out was that that's not the issue. So he ordered the part to address the vents and he found that that thing that was hanging down is the result of a missing panel mm -hmm. with a light in it. That thing was supposed to connect to a light in a panel oh, no. that lights up the driver's footwell. No way. So, so it's literally missing a full panel. Well, yeah, under the um, driver's oh, no. or above the driver's footwell, right? Okay. You, you, you would never know it. Yeah, right? sure. I, yeah. I've had the car for two months and never knew <laughs> yeah. that there was a panel missing there. That's Jeez. really so, funny. He ordered those three things, and he'll get back to me here, promised, within a week. So so, so what would you do? Sorry, Francie, you can go ahead. But I was just curious what, what Brian did with it. Basically, when you well, after you first got it, delivery came. Yeah. Are you does, – does Fisker have a recommendation on a charge limit? How are you using the car? What, how does that all work? Because I'm also yeah. – you, you're noting all these things that are wrong. The vents don't work, but also you went on a long road trip. So you were like, okay, we know that things aren't perfect here, but we're still going to take it out. So Kyle, like you, we don't buy cars for garage ornaments, right? We drive them. And um, in this case, it was my wife's car. It already had 55 miles on it. She literally asked me, she said, Brian, please don't drive my car. I want to experience it. I want to drive it. And I'm like, come on, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta go test this thing. So literally that night after Kevin left, and by the way, he took a, a lift all the way back to Dulles Airport, where his hotel was. Oh my um, god, had to have been an hour and forty five minutes at least. A anyway, after he left, I took it out on the road for an initial drive. It's got three drive modes. You know, Earth is sort of their conserve mode, where it's just in front wheel drive, as you know, Kyle. Um, fun mode puts it into all wheel drive with a little more pep. And then there's hype hyper, right? And hyper feels like a Tesla or a Rivian where it's giving you the, you know, the throttle response that you expect. Um, so anyway, Francie, it ended up being maybe a, a week or so a week and a half later, um, with almost no driving on, on this thing that we got ready for our, our road trip. The vehicle has a 32 amp onboard charger for level two, right? That's what I said, right? That's a miss, right? It's 2023. Yeah. This thing should at least be 48 amps. Exactly. 48 amps okay. minimum premium electric SUV here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. That's our reality. So that's fine. In our garage, I've got two uh, 50 amp circuits. Into one of them, I have my old. 2016 Model X 40 amp Tesla EVSE cable. And then I've got the 32 amp from our Model 3, right? So I bought the Electron 48 amp um, Tesla to J1772 adapter, and that's what we're using. Well, I plugged it in to the 32 amp EVSE, and it, it blinks green, indicating that it's making the, the the handshake then it goes to a solid green when it's charging in this case it did the, the blinking green and then it went to a fault state with a red light so it didn't like the 32 amp evsc which i couldn't understand troubleshot that for a while couldn't figure it out moved to the 40 amp evsc and it worked instantly so we were using that to chart yeah weird right with a 32 amp charger didn't make any sense to me. Now, what I've subsequently learned is that even though it was in the faulted state on the 32, if you just leave it, <laughs> it eventually starts to charge. Ah, uh, so my, um, I have uh, wall connectors newer than the 40 amp unit. So I assume similar logic to the 32 amp mobile connector that you're using. And when I plug my Rivian in at home, it always faults. And then it goes to a fallback with pulse width modulation and then starts charging. So it sounds like the old Tesla UMC must communicate on a different path than the new one. And the car has to fall back to communicate with it. But so, so you've tried it now on the 32 amp where it'll go red, everything freaks out, and then it'll reset and charge properly. Yeah. If you look at it in the app, which is a whole other story, um, it actually says it's charging and eventually it does charge. Now, 
our Rivian charged on that 32 amp EVIC just fine. I've never had a fault with the Rivian. So that's why I was concerned when we saw this with the Fisker. Um, so that was the first challenge that I, I saw. We noted it and, and moved on to our road trip. Now, from here, you know, we drove all the way to the end of the turnpike to, I think, Carteret, New Jersey, to an EVgo uh, 200 amp, uh, 200 kilowatt station and uh, plugged in, worked fine. Um, it was kind of weird. This was November 1st that we're doing, <laughs> doing the road trip. Our credit card expired on October 31st, right? So we ended up, it's supposed to automatically update with the new uh, expiration date, but my wife cut that off. So we had to, you know, do some work there within the app, but it charged fine. Our second charging stop was in Warwick, Rhode Island. Now, at this point, she's driving the Fisker. I'm driving our Model X because we're relocating the Model X up there. So I'm driving behind her. We get to Warwick with about 50 miles of range on both vehicles. She goes to the EVgo. I go to Tesla. And 15 minutes later, I get text messages from her saying, hey, the, the car won't charge. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'll, I'll be right there as soon as I'm done. Anyway, long story short, I finish charging. I go over there. She still can't get it to work, right? And my wife, like me, she's been experienced with EVs for a decade. So we called EVgo. They couldn't figure out what was going on. We called Fisker. They couldn't figure out what was going on. At this point, she pulls in with about 25 miles of range. Temperatures are in the 40s. Uh, there are other vehicles, like uh, we saw Kona, we saw EV6 charging on that EVgo unit with no issue. Um, this was a Delta 100 unit. The long and short of this is we came to find out that um, there's a, an issue with the handshake between the Delta 100 units and the Fisker Ocean. Uh, which, to my knowledge, is still an open issue right now. Fisker called me two weekends ago to say that they've identified the issue, they've talked to EVgo, and the next firmware update should address it. I don't know how often EVgo um, updates their firmware, but um, that's an open issue right now. Now, the car drained all the way down to 10 miles of range, so we're in plug share trying to figure out, okay, where do we go? There was a charge point site that had two 62 and a half kilowatt units and six of their level twos. So we said, let's drive over there. Just like less than three miles away. We get there and I kid you not, we're pulling into the parking lot and there are two huge electrical vans parked in front of the DC fast chargers there for charge point. All the equipment is spread out on the curb. No. So those units are offline. So and, and the guy is the guys are in their vehicles. So I pull up and ask him, hey, you know, are you guys going to be done soon? It's like, yeah, this is going to be a couple of hours here. You know, we're just getting going. Somebody no. um, did something to it. So they were repairing. So the long story short there is we ended up using the level two. You know, I, I walked the dog. My wife was studying and we got just enough charge in about 45 minutes to make it to Providence, where we were able to get on an EA. I know I've been going on, but this is where it gets interesting. Mm. With the state of charge now inside of 10%, the touchscreen on our Fisker started to go. Um, it started blinking. Oh, no. Uh, it turned gray. It eventually became unresponsive. So we're charging on a level two. <laughs> The touch screen is unresponsive. So we called the support line, got someone on the call, and they said, listen, I know you've got this issue with the touch screen, but right now the concern is getting your vehicle from 6% state of charge, right? So we focused on that. We got it to about 10, 12% in 45 minutes, got to our next charging spot. And on that drive from Warwick to Providence, which isn't terribly long, we didn't really have a touch screen, right? So we were using uh, our phones for navigation. 
Um, and I've since come to realize just this past weekend, because I ran it down below 10% again. Um, mm. And when you get to below 15%, 10% and below, um, something happens where the touchscreen doesn't like that state of charge on the powertrain. And so it, it goes a little wonky. So that's something I've got to work through with them. That's yeah. crazy. So like the thing is a lot of these issues are not uncommon for us when we test vehicles at times. For example, I was just driving some prototype vehicles, had some issues with communications, but these are pre-series vehicles. It's before the car goes on sale. You expect some problems and you get them sorted before they go on sale. And Fisker has done a ton of videos. Uh, yeah, of course they're an American company, but most of the test cars came from Austria and everything, but you know, they've done a ton of videos showing their hot weather testing and cold weather testing and all of these pre-series tests that they've run the car through. Um, these are all issues that should have been flagged, sorted, solved before, you know, before the on sale date, they could have built the cars and then flashed the software. But just the fact that you're having interoperability issues on one of the most popular charging hardware units in the U S is crazy. Like that should have been sorted way early on. So has Fisker given you any indication that they're like, Oh, we're really sorry. Like this is an early one. Like we're still trying to get our, you know what together, what, what are they telling you in response to all of these, honestly, almost prototype issues that you're dealing with on a series production model? Um, well, they're, they're, they're not telling us anything as it relates to that, right? They're, they're noting the issues and they're, you know, working with their teams to address it. Um, our support tech that came yesterday um, said, you know, it was kind of a copped and obvious statement, right? Um, the Fisker One owners are the beta testers, right? Um, and most of us signed up for that, right? We, we know that being this early, that there'll be some things that you have to, um, to deal with. But some of the things that we're dealing with are, are unexpected, right? So, uh, Kyle, you'll love this. Um, everything that you do with this vehicle requires the key fob, right? It, it's a Bluetooth NF, NFC situation there, right? And it's probably been the number one most frustrating thing, not necessarily for, for me or for us, but for a lot of the owners out there in the community, where we've had this thing for two months. We are currently on our third CR2035 <laughs> battery for it, right? Um, there's no proximity such that when you get close to the vehicle, it, it recognizes and unlocks. You literally have to either press unlock on the key fob or touch the key fob to the uh, door handle, mm. right? In order to unlock or lock the vehicle, right? So you always have to have this thing, right? There's no phone is key yet. That's coming via OTA. Um, and by the way, we've had two OTAs in two months. So that's a good sign, right? And they're, we're expecting another one next month. Um, but you have to have the key, on you to get into and out of the vehicle in terms of unlock and lock. And you also need it in order to drive the vehicle. There's no start stop button, but you need your key fob in order to start it. So that's been pretty frustrating. Um, what, what I don't understand is so, so Fisker partnered with Magna who we're really close with Magna. They sponsored out of spec reviews this year. Like we know those people pretty well. Um, from the top level. And this is a company that is their core competency is building parts for cars and final assembly of vehicles. Like this is what they do. And what's crazy to me is the ocean is coming out from, yeah, sir, a startup automaker, but with using the, the folks who literally build the G wagon, which is probably the most sorted solid vehicle you can build. And it just seems like I've driven Magna prototypes that are better sorted than some of the things you're telling me. Now, of course, I'm sure the Fisker's built well. In my experience, the door closures are solid, you know, material. Paint is impeccable, yeah. right? Um, yeah. What I'm dealing with isn't paint quality. It's just, you know, detailing pre-delivery, right? Um, yeah. 
No, you're right about all those things. And that was part of our my calculus, right? I knew that this was a calculated risk, right? Fisker uh, Automotive obviously failed, went bankrupt. But I felt like Henrik is a next level auto designer, right? He's got that reputation. We cannot take that from him. I figured that he and Gita, with their past history, would have learned from that, applied those lessons. And I love the combination of him focusing on design and Ma Magna focusing on manufacturing, right? I figured that would be an unstoppable combination. However, in this case, Magna is really just assembling the vehicle, right? And as we talked about earlier, these vehicles are computers on wheels. And so the software defined <laughs> stack for the vehicle is ultimately what's going to determine success or failure, great or poor ownership experience and so on. And that's where I still have guarded optimism and concern, right? In terms of Fisker's ability to execute on software, delivery at scale, right? They, they did something that was unique, which is getting homologated both in the US and I think in eight other European countries at the same time, right? That's a big deal. That's hard to do, right? So you need to have your logistics stuff in order in order to deliver at scale across those markets as well as to provide support for owners across all those markets and that's kind of where we're at right now the driving experience kyle amazing right i love the way the vehicle drives although like you i'm still not sold about the front wheel drive bias right this thing's got a ton of power right and performance even on the 22s the the dampers and the ride quality is amazing right that you would think you're on an air suspension and you're not right so those aspects of it are really cool there's some really cool things in terms of the software the california mode stuff um I think the solar panels might be a gimmick. We'll have to wait and see once that software gets enabled. But there's a lot of things to like, right? Um, and for us, that was all part of our calculus, right? Along with the fact that it's not a Model Y, right? We wanted something different. But execution on software, delivery, and service is the big question right now that um, I think all of us as owners, as well as the market, um, are waiting to see. The so good there's news, an opportunity for them. The good news is all of this can be sorted. I don't think there's like any inherent component in your vehicle per se, at least from the outside looking in, that seems to be like a physical limitation of what you're experiencing. It all seems to be software bugs, glitches, uncontrol logic. Obviously, you have a missing panel, but that'll get replaced, I'm sure. Um, so it seems like it's all solvable. When I drove the Fisker for the first time, I think I was the first journalist to drive it, uh, or first reviewer to drive it. And I kind of went to like, I was. it was at CES last year, and they had like an investor thing where they were driving around the Fisker and I just walked up and like, I know some of the people there and I was like, Henrik, can I drive your, your thing? And he's like, ah, oh, yeah, go take it out. So I, you know, I put some GoPros in and I drove it, but I also had the, I can't remember exactly his name or role, but someone either who is head of software or very high up in the software division sitting passenger seat with me and my impression. And, you know, I'm lucky enough where I get to meet a lot of people at different car companies responsible for different components of their vehicle that this person genuinely did not understand what the software was capable of it. He didn't know if there was going to be route planning that did preconditioning plug in charge. Wasn't a thing. Um, you know, it, it started glitching and doing things, but I thought, okay, it's still early days. This is a you know six months at least from start of series production. There's some time to dial all this in, and it seems like my impression is uh, the build you know the Magna stuff. I do think Magna you know overextended themselves on this car. That was a big risk for them to to take to do this one, and I think maybe they went a little bit too 
hardcore trusting into Fisker, uh, you know, sort of after some other issues, but it, the, the, um, the thing is the, the software just needs to get so much better so quickly. And I'm not sure there's anyone there that has given you or me or owners confidence that they can actually pull this off. Uh, and so, you know, here you are with a very expensive vehicle in your driveway and many other owners that I'm sure will be listening to this, that where, where's Fisker saying, Hey, we know we got some issues. Hey, we know these things are coming, but like, here's actually what we're working on. Not just, it'll be fixed in the next firmware update, but tell us what the issues are. Tell us what's going on and then tell us how the fixes will work. It seems like communication, at least from our side, trying to talk to their press people is like you're on the list to drive one we'll let you know when a car is available and what that sounds like to me is we'll let you know when we have a software update and then we'll send you a car i don't know what's what's your impression of what fisker could do to kind of fix this and they need to fix it quickly yeah so you called it communication i i would use the term transparency right um there hasn't been enough consistent transparent communication Right. Um, not only are, are many of us early adopters in terms of plunking down hard earned money on the vehicles, uh, many of us are also investors. Right. So we're all in. Right. And so as a manufacturer with this type of community support, right, I, I would think they would want to reach out and put, your, put their arms around us in terms of having this type of a conversation to gather our feedback and maybe it's happening and I'm not a part of it, but I'm not aware that uh, they're, they're doing that and that they're being as transparent as I and others feel like they can and should be right. But I go back to the fact that there is a huge opportunity here. This vehicle starts at 39,000 and that's after they just increased the price on the low end, $1,500 brought the top end down to 61.5, right? So it's highly competitive. It's a little bit bigger, and I would argue perhaps a better design than Model Y, the, the benchmark, if you will. It has a feature set just with an opening uh, panoramic roof, right? Everything else now has a solid glass roof. Uh, there are some things in the software that I love. It recognizes when I'm at a traffic light right? Whether it's red. So if I'm at a traffic light and it's red, when that traffic light turns green, which oftentimes at that point, many of us are on our phones, right? It actually dings to let you know the light is green, right? Before the per person behind you starts to honk at you. So little things like that, right? It's got um, dual um, pads for you, wireless charging pads for you to charge your phone. Right. Every time I open the door to exit the vehicle, I get a ding reminder chime. Hey, you're leaving your phone in the car. Right. So little things like that are well thought out. The interior, the design, there's a huge opportunity here. And they actually just delivered their first sport edition, which is that thirty nine thousand dollar one in the UK. Um, so Magna is doing their job in terms of building these things, getting them out there. But again, Fisker has to execute on the software, the delivery at scale in a timely manner to customers, especially after we fade, as well as uh, to support it, right? And I'm shocked that they had such a late start on those two last aspects of delivery and support. Um, since they were expecting to have delivered all 5,000 ones, they told um, the market that that would be done by the end of September. And here we are at the end of December and they're not quite there. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I it definitely seems like Fisker has some work to do to not only address what you're experiencing, but I'm interested if this is widespread, if you know your experience is the norm. Uh, so they really need to step up to the plate there. So based on your experience, so far, Brian, and you know, you're, you're invested in the company, like, you know, you're really interested in all of this, but who would you recommend this EV for? Or if a friend was looking to make the switch to electric, would you say, yeah, take the risk on the Fisker Ocean one? So that, that's a that's a really good question there, Francie. Um, 
I think overall where I am now after two months of, of ownership with this vehicle is still more so on the side of wanting to recommend it, but it's not the right vehicle for everybody. Right. If this is going to be your only, if it's going to be your first EV and it's going to be your primary vehicle, right. You need to go into it eyes wide open. And by that, I mean, you need to understand that where the vehicle is today is going to be somewhat challenging, right? For a first time EV owner, right? Mm -hmm. It's a computer on wheels and the software is very much a work in progress. I don't have adaptive cruise control right now, right? That's coming via OTA. Now, the good news is I've gotten one a month, right? And I'm expecting another OTA before the end of this week and another one in January, right? That's making the vehicle better over time. So if you're going to place an order now, your delivery is going to be best case in three months, unless you buy something that's an in inventory. Um, so you've got to go into it with eyes wide open. But in terms of the build quality, in terms of paint quality, the look of the vehicle, the feel of the materials on the inside of the vehicle. Um, even with the charging, we mentioned the 32 amp charging, as well as the DC fast charging. The 32 amp charger here in my garage, it charges just as fast as my 2018 Model S, as well as our Rivian, if not a little bit faster, right? Even with the 32 amp charging. On a DC fast charger, the highest I've seen is about 70, 175 kilowatt. And I've had another person mention they've gone as high as 183. So it's plenty fast. It's, it's good enough. It's not, you know, market leading. So everything that you need is there, but there's going to be some issues with things like adaptive cruise, the um, key fob situation, right? And other software glitches that you'll just have to deal with until the software gets fully baked, right? Definitely. But, you know, we just saw this with Chevy, right? With the new, um, what the it's Blazer. not the Equinox, the Blazer, right? They literally had to do a, a stop sale. That's right? a disaster. So it, it's not unique to Fisker, but they are working at this. And I remain cautiously optimistic that that they can turn this around to your point, Kyle. Yeah, me too. I think once once they kind of like you know put all of the company's focus on right now, it's like okay, if they figured out the production side, leave that to Magna. They figured out logistics. Let's get the delivery, the service center stuff going. But sort of all focus on software, completing features in the vehicle, making it rock solid, making it interoperable with the. Uh, you know, charging infrastructure in each specific region to where they're sold and just reducing glitches, then it seems like a really cool car. And if they're really charged, I hadn't heard they were charging at 180 kilowatts. That's not bad. I mean, the curve, of course, we'll do all the tests when we can, but maybe Brian, I'll come out, we'll use your car. We'll do some, some out of spec tests with it. That could be pretty fun. Well, like I said, we've got other vehicles that we can drive. So if you want to come out here, um, we're going to head up to the Cape. So we're actually going to drive by, uh, Dave and, and out of spec mom on our way to and back. But, um, that offers on the table. If you, you'd like to take us up on it, Kyle. Yeah, thanks. And actually we just did a podcast with uh, a friend of our parents, my parents who own an EV nine on the Cape. So we might uh, come out. That, and that's what that inspired up. my outreach to you guys. I, I saw your interview with Matt last week. And uh, figured, you know, EV9, uh, I really, like I said, I'm cautiously optimistic and hopeful that we can get more of these Fiskers out there because um, it, it's, it's a great option into the market, uh, especially if somebody is looking for something other uh, than a Model Y. Yeah, we don't have like a great Model Y alternative. They're all like okay, yeah. but each one has like their own little niggle about them. Like Maki -E gives you power for five seconds and it charges kind of meh, and ID4 is a little bit boring. And, you know, each one has like a little thing, but the Fisker is exciting. It looks great. It's got awesome performance. 
It just needs that final 5% polish to make sure it works everywhere. Um, and once that happens, I, I really can't wait until the day where I can go and say, you should go buy a Fisker Ocean. Mm -hmm. Today's not the day, but once it gets sorted, uh, I'm looking forward to that because I, I have... I, I'm so excited just about the design and, and, and literally the feel of that car is great. I don't like the front wheel drive stuff, but I heard the OTA will make it a bit more rear biased as well. So looking yes. forward to that next month. Yeah. And the other thing, the last thing I'll say about Fisker is the rest of their lineup, Kyle, Francie, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but with what they've got coming next with the pair, uh, as well as the Alaska, which is a, uh, I guess a compact pickup truck, even smaller, than the um, Rivian R1T and built on the same platform as the Ocean, there's such an opportunity in front of them if they can execute, right? So yeah, definitely the potential is there, and it would it would be really fun, Kyle, if you could do a bit of EV EV listener hopping, just hop around borrowing. Yeah, if <laughs> anyone's got a cyber truck, a let bit. me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. That'll complete it all. Yeah. But Brian, thank you much, so much for your generosity in offering up, you know, to t tell about your story, to even let us take your Fisker Ocean One out. And it was really interesting to hear your experience from, you know, the good to the bad. And it'll be interesting to see what Fisker does next. Like Kyle said, it's kind of a work in progress here. But yeah, I really appreciate you coming on to the Out of Spec podcast. Thanks for having me. Hopefully, you guys and, and the audience found this. Uh, um, objective and helpful. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Let us know, uh, audience listeners, if you have any questions, put them in the comments and we'll try to get you answers. So thank you again, Brian. Thanks Kyle for joining me and audience. We will see you next time on the out of spec podcast.